Right, let's move on because David Nusifora gave uh, an annual address, I think. Is it once a year? Is it twice a year maybe? He does these roundtable um, press conferences and you were at it, Owen, so uh, we have an opportunity here to see some of the stuff. Are, are we going to explain what we're about to watch first or are we going to yeah, watch first? Like, I, mean, I think it is a, it's twice a year at this point, isn't it, New Sephora? And I, I think when we think about what New Sephora has used these press conferences for in the past, it, it is generally kind of like a, a state of the union almost. He's kind of fronting up about everything and yesterday was quite a lot to do with the financial situation of the IRFU things looking particularly bleak on that front, things looking a little bit more positive when it comes to a potential a possibility of a full house later on this year in, in the Aviva Stadium. Um, quite often you get a situation where there is a World Cup disaster to pick through or a Six Nations disaster to pick through and uh, sometimes heads roll or certain people are thrown under a bus. I think that there is a general acceptance of circumstance when it comes to some of the down moments in this year's Six Nations, but also the fact that Ireland won that last game against England, I think, changes the tone of these conversations completely. The tone of yesterday's conversation then kind of went on to a few other different things. The contractual situation at this time of the year, obviously, such a big thing, hoping to, to sign up Tyke Furlong for a bit of a longer contract next year when, the, when the, the situation comes back up and also talks about the fact that CJ Stander was, was not going to be moved on his decision. It was certainly not a financial decision, he put it yesterday, David Nusifor, which means that I would say the offer from the IRFU was, was a very generous one and uh, Stander obviously had his own situation that he wasn't going to continue to play. We were going to play a clip now where we get into the conversation around some of the players, I guess lower down the, the pecking order when it comes to the national team at least, who are going to be leaving these shores. James Cronin and Quinn Rue are a couple of the names mentioned in the question here. And Dusifora was asked if there was any scope to keep those sort of players within the Irish system. Yeah, well, you know, at the same time, you know, I've just, uh, it is, rugby is a business too. And um, you get to a point where uh, you've got to look at, um, uh, you've got to look at at affordability, you've got to look at, uh, you know, um, sometimes you get to a point where you might have talent coming through and it's a decision that has to be made around, um, you know, cost benefit. And uh, that's the that's the brutal truth of professional sports sometimes. And uh, you've got to say, well, OK, we can't afford to pay that, a much, uh, that amount of money for a particular player. Uh, we have uh, X, Y or Z coming through underneath that they're going to be worth more over time. They've got longevity in the position and we have to, we have to keep that churn in that particular position going. And, um, you know, they're just decisions that have to be made at times and it's unfortunate um, because you're dealing obviously with people, but, um, but at the same time, um, it is a business and you have to make business decisions as well as trying to, to look after them as people. And that's just a, a, the way that the professional sport works, unfortunately. Thanks, David. David, just on, on that point that you made there, can I ask you about the Jason Jenkins move to Munster? Uh, did you consider blocking that move given the amount of homegrown players in that position and their prospects of game time obviously now being diminished by his arrival? Uh, no, it's not a matter of blocking it. I, I suppose it's, we, we talk, uh, we, we speak with each of the provinces and we sit down and we look at what the rationale is um, and you, you judge every case individually on, uh, on how it benefits um, the system and the teams. And, uh, you know, with, with CJ leaving at very short notice, um, it disrupted their planning around what they needed going forward in the balance of their team. Um, there are plans in place for how we intend bringing some of the younger players through and what sort of game time and exposure they get and uh, it, it was based around CJ being here I suppose um, and uh, when CJ left um, we sat down and we discussed how we were going to deal with it and uh, we looked at a particular type of player that would be suitable to replace CJ and um, we looked at the term, uh, the tenure of that contract that would fit back into the model and uh, a one year uh, tenure was agreed between ourselves and Munster and therefore they had to find someone who was suited what they needed and was happy to take a one-year deal. 
and uh, and that's that's how we came up with the decision that was made. I think that sounds fair enough, right? It's like uh, there's a hole here. We need to fix it. We're not going to fix it. With somebody who's going to come in and take three or four years out. Maybe the the young players are going to play a lot more next year than they would have done if CJ was there. But obviously CJ would have been away for those 10, 15 games a season, and we would have managed his minutes. So there's, you know, it, there's a it's a, a complicated cocktail when it comes to making sure that you've got cover and you still need to be able to reach a European semi final slash final. And the sense that maybe the the monster. A pipeline isn't uh, producing players the way it used to as well and there are uh, a couple of players in those positions who, who look right to actually have a big season next year and maybe there was uh, a sense that they'll be kind of pushed back a little bit but uh, I do think I think that signing was confirmed before Stander confirmed his departure if I'm not mistaken so it's prob the tone is probably a little bit different to the way people look at it now because the Stander thing obviously does change that, that pecking order quite considerably with the exception of course of those games during the, the Six Nations but um, yeah like it's a, there was no as I mentioned there was no sort of sense from the live section anyway and we're going to get into some of the embargo stuff in a, in a moment but there was no sense from the, the, the live section that, that New Sephora was out to uh, be overly defensive yesterday about anything I think there was a real acceptance that uh, Irish rugby is in the situation that it's in, uh, which isn't a grim one. I think that when it comes to the situation that's affected everybody, uh, that they've done okay. And I mean, it's it, it's it, it's grim, but it's not like Ireland are doing worse than than other rugby unions around the world. Um, like when it came to the performance of the national team, he kind of referred to this idea of a, a team dropping off a cliff, and he says that no team should ever be dropping off a cliff at any point that you might have a slight downturn and then you build back up so I think that was probably just uh, a little bit of uh, kind of a, a mention of the form recently that it has been a little bit of a downturn since 2018 from the national team but uh, the team will continue to, to build and um, the fact that they haven't had two summer tours to, to build on um, or try and build back up I should say that's been a big deal because he mentioned it a couple of times yesterday as well it's um, it's always worth taking a moment to consider the body of work that somebody in his role has put together over the period of time he's been here. Because he's in the final year of the current contract, which is a three-year deal, and before that it was a five-year deal. So essentially this is year seven of eight, is that correct? Yeah, and yeah, it, it does seem that, like a, I mean, the, the decision next year is going to be one that I'd say nobody kind of really knows at the moment, that it, it does look as if he's leaning outside of the job, actually. So... Um, yeah, we'll have to wait and see how that goes, but that's 2022 is the end of his current deal for sure. And I know he spent some time back home in Australia and maybe the pandemic changes things for everyone at this point. Like, when you go through the newspapers in this morning who uh, had embargoed stuff to, to publish, there was also the question around Ronan O'Gara. I'm not sure um, the, the Irish Examiner this morning's their headline is Courageous O'Gara could coach Ireland without coming home first, which is a pretty big deal. Yeah, so I, like, I don't know if this was ever said, but it certainly was intimated in the past that you needed to be part of the coaching setup in Ireland before you would be considered as a candidate for the head coaching job. And, you know, if you look back traditionally, that would have been what would have happened, that somebody would have got the gig from within the Irish setup. Um, this is interesting because if, if it's... So what, what exactly is the quote about uh, looking outside the system? Um, so, New Sephora, um, does someone need to come home? No, no, there's always different ways of doing things. I'd be a great supporter of people going offshore and gaining new and different experiences. I think Ronan has been really courageous in the moves that he's made to go out there and try and develop himself as a coach. And I think it's a good thing for more of our coaches to do that and gain experience. May it be that he comes back through the provincial system? Maybe, but it's not a requirement. I think there are lots of different ways to get our coaches to develop and coaching overseas in different environments is a healthy one. First off, that's true, right? It is really good for many Irish coaches to get as much experience as possible given that there aren't that many jobs within the Irish system and the Irish setup. And then the best thing is for them to go off and spread their wings and uh, at some point if they want to come back, come back. But equally, this opens up the possibility of pretty much anybody getting the Ireland job in the future, which again, it leaves you more opportunity to get the right person for the job as opposed to being shoehorned into the specifics of the people who are available at the moment. Now, we have great coaches working in the provincial system at the moment, so it's not really an issue. Like, if, if the Leinster coaching ticket took the Ireland job, no one would bat an eyelid because of the quality of the work that they've done. 
and at various stages if, if other people from the other provinces were to be part of that backroom team and to be uh, in line for or if ultimately what they're doing is they're working on Paul O'Connell for him to be an Ireland coach at some point in the future again that all makes perfect sense but say Pat Lamb decided at some point that he wanted a crack at international rugby after he's achieved everything he possibly can in the English club game because he knows Ireland and has a connection with Ireland are we saying no you can't take the job News 4 has opened the door not just for O'Gara but for Pat Lamb and for people like that too which seems like a wise thing to do to me it seems like a progressive moment here and I again I have never seen it written down in cold black and white you need to be working in the provincial system maybe it was it was certainly the impression that we had and I think that's like a significant shift now if you're a player reading that saying I think it's good for you to go off and have experience offshore and learn new things you're like well you don't mean for me though do you mm. I mean Ty Furlong's not reading that going that's interesting does that apply to me? Yeah. Can, yeah. I, can I have a year earning a million quid, two years earning a million quid and still playing the World Cup? How does that sound? Would that work? Like what's interesting there that you, you mentioned that now is about the, the pathway for coaches in Ireland. One of the things that he mentioned in his opening address yesterday is that Matt Wilkie is gone from the IRFU. So he would have been, I want to get his correct title, IRFU Head of Coach Development. So, so he's left the role and I presume that they're looking for somebody uh, to step up to that. So. Development of coaches is something that Nusa Forest said has been affected over the last little while and, and they are, I guess, maybe at the mercy of the provinces essentially putting in a body of work that suggests that they're being run by the right people on a coaching level and that those coaches then are right for picking by the IRFU. And I guess that's a, that's a fair enough system because that's the only level that you're going to get outside of Test Rugby that is that closely resembles Test Rugby, which is Pro 14 and Champions Cup Rugby. So that's probably the system at the moment that, that works the best, but there is this um, legend of the game who is doing great things away from Ireland at the moment and if there is an unwritten rule that you have to come up through the ranks then you can see why they would make an exception if it were to come to that. Yeah, and uh, that makes a lot of sense as well. The other thing is that like on balance, it, there, there's two things here. There's the, 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 the issues that you might have with what Yusuf Four has done and there's, there's clearly, and it's fine to have those issues and everybody should, should excavate them and you know, the relationship with the team, you know, how much of a hands-on role does he have and, and like what, what, what's that relationship like with the coaches and then the hard and fast rule on whether or not players are allowed to go and why the exception was made for Sexton and all that kind of stuff. And the, the, the club game I know is a constant stick that, that people bring up to kind of say, well, why is he not fixing the, the problems with the club game? But you've got to also bear in mind that if he wasn't there, what was there beforehand and just how chaotic a lot of this decision making was that was going on before there was somebody whose job it was to manage the ebb and flow of the contractual situation and um, it, you know we don't know what life would have been like if they'd had a different character there instead of him but on balance you would say that most of the stuff I, I think loads of the decisions they've made over the years have been wrong but on balance you would say that uh, Irish rugby is better for having somebody in that role and he's doing a reasonable job in that role it's interesting when you kind of think about what is the, the job spec, like the club game, dying on the vine has been a massive failure of, within Irish rugby. I'm not sure is that the failure of a certain individual or is that the failure of Irish rugby itself to allow it to die and even if using the word allow is actually unfair. It may, maybe this is just a natural reaction to raging professionalism in rugby and the, the national team becoming the, the clear product that everything was geared towards uh, within Irish rugby, that, that, um, that the provinces became their own different behemoths all around the country, that maybe the club game dying was just going to be a natural reaction, but it still happened and there will still be questions asked of people at the top of the IRFU as to how that happened and what efforts are being made to resurrect that and it does seem that it's been a conversation that's been happening for quite a long time and there isn't any more clarity as to how the club game will get any more relevant and maybe that just doesn't happen in the, the short term future. The same goes for the women's game. Nusa Four listed off a lot of uh, nice sounding initiatives that are happening with the women's game yesterday. He's definitely of the opinion that grassroots work needs to be done before we even entertain the idea of professional rugby. That's he seems pretty clear in that in fairness and I think when somebody's got a clear idea of what they're doing and they go ahead and do it that that that's fine. But I think that personally I maybe would disagree with that a little bit that actually having a professional model in the short term may actually encourage the grassroots level as well. Now of course we're looking at an organisation who has had two massive years of incurring massive debt 
So maybe actually starting up a new professional system is just not a runner right now. And that's the truth to, to why this isn't happening in the short term. But if that wasn't as much of an issue as, as maybe it, it, it could be, then I do think that the, the sooner the better. Or even a timeline of when Irish rugby wants to see professional rugby brought in in the women's game might be good because at least if you're a younger player, you could be like, all right, I'll get a few years at the end of my career where I'm you know, getting paid to do this thing. Yeah, all right, 18 minutes past 8 this morning here on OTBAM.